Welcome everybody to the Green Plum 5 meetup today. Thanks every, everybody for, for showing up and coming today. And Green Plum went GA on September 14th. So this is our first meetup after the launch of Green Plum 5. And this is a real milestone for us that I'm happy to share with everybody. You know, we, we started out about two years ago, 2015, building the open source version of Greenplum. We went to the PGConf Europe or the Postgres Europe uh, conference in Vienna to, to celebrate our open source uh, launch. And now we are officially live GA with Greenplum version five. So congrats to everybody on the accomplishment. And um, so firstly, I want to celebrate some of the key things that we are seeing in the, in the community and the launch of Greenplum 5. So as you can see here, um, a number of these key items listed, uh, there's a vibrant mailing list going on on the Greenplum open source. Um, there's about three, 400 subscribers to that mailing list. And there's, there's active email conversations, both on the developer list and the user list. We've got a GitHub project where you can see all the commits going in. Now that Greenplum 5 is launched, we have both a Greenplum 5 branch and a master branch where we continue to develop for the next major version of, of the product. Um, you can also see us on a Slack channel and through the meetups and on YouTube, a lot of activity. So we're really building out the community. And I think this is just the, really the beginning of the community building. Although the technology Greenplum has been going for 10 years and the underlying Postgres for almost you know, 20 years plus, but the, the Greenplum open source community is really just starting to take off. Um, the other thing that I would uh, call out is um, the, so we, we are, we have been sticking with one month cadence for our releases. So we're going to continue to do five, five, um, service packs. It so will be doing 5.1, 5.2, 5.3. And then I'll talk about our roadmap toward a little bit at the end of this talk as to where we're going with future releases. Um, so the three key, three key pillars on green plum five, number one is the fact that green plum is a software product. So there's a lot of uh, kind of hype going around these days about getting a database as a service or running, you know, a database without servers. They call it, hey, are you going to be serverless? Um, but when it comes down to it, the value prop is that we're building a software product. We're building an open source software product. That product can be run on your own servers. It can be run um, through partners, through, through, it can be run in the cloud. It can be run on a hardware appliance. That key technology that we're all collaborating and investing on together is portable and, and agnostic to the underlying infrastructure. So you can have Greenplum in Amazon, you can have Greenplum in Google, you can have Greenplum on VMware, you can have Greenplum in a bespoke setup. That core technology is the key, the key point. And I think that's a winning strategy for us. Um, the second key point is the, is the server itself and what we're bringing there and the fact that Again, you know, kind of looking at the trends in the trends in big data, if you go back in time a bit, you know, you had your proprietary appliances were, were really the key initiative back in the early 2000s, where you're looking at big companies doing proprietary data warehouse appliances. Um, the Hadoop wave came in and, and said, hey, let's do something open source. Let's break the boundaries here. Let's, let's lower the cost point. Um, I think with Greenplum, the key point is that we can build a huge database. You can build a petabyte scale database, compress all that data, and still run it in the form factor of a, of a relational database model and do both your high performance business intelligence with the most advanced SQL in the world, and at the same time do in database advanced analytics that you, would, that you can easily understand in a database form factor. So you can iteratively explore your data, query your data, do advanced functions and algorithms to understand what's in the data and to create analysis. And the third key point is about the process, right? It's about the fact that we're open source, that we're, we're continuing to, to work on a, on a rapid release cadence, 
to, to embrace the, the large community of both Greenplum and Postgres developers to, to build this database technology and to move fast and rely on core database expertise that we have in this community to do advanced SQL and, and, and big data at high performance. So just drilling quickly into the, um, the platform side, just to illustrate it a bit, there's tons of folks running bare metal. Bare metal is really, um, at the end of the day, it's your lowest cost, but, but it also has the, the fact that you have to actually buy and ship and deliver the machines. So a lot of folks with really big clusters build their own clusters. They like to get their own hardware. They optimize their hardware. They know their hardware. They tune their hardware and they get the best performance at the best value. A lot of other folks don't want to deal with that. They want to just have it provisioned in the cloud with a single click. And that's an option too. That's cool too. And then other folks want to be on premise, but they want to do something virtual and use like a, a, pl a platform like VMware to, to orchestrate this. So all of these options are available. And that's the key point is we're building a database software that you can run on any of these platforms. Um, moving on to the, the second pillar of the, of the software functionality, you know, the, the key message again is let's do your, let's take what, what happened in the past. You've got your legacy data warehouse, you know, that, that data warehousing appliance that had high performance business intelligence, but came at that really high cost price tag. Then you had your other system for advanced analytics and machine learning. What, with Greenplum, you can do all that together in, in a big, powerful database. You could do your high-performance SQL and your advanced analytics in one place and break down the, the silos. So in particular, what is Greenplum version 5 bringing? So with v version 5, I wanted to call out three key, three key areas. Number one is workload management. So when you look at a complex system at a large corporation, the database is not a single user system, it's a multi-user system. And the key is how do we share the system? How do we get the most out of the system? How do, we, how do we divide the resources among everybody? And that's where in Greenplum 5, we introduce resource groups. Resource groups leverage underlying Linux C groups in order to segregate the, the resources of the system and to set policies that you can use to, to, to allocate percentages. And I'll talk a bit more about that. The second one is performance. So there's quite a number of gains in performance in Greenplum 5, starting with the optimizer. So the Orca optimizer, which is a Greenplum dedicated optimizer, which I'll show you about, is the default primary optimizer in GP5 and can really perform on complex queries. We've increased the speed of analyze. We've increased the speed of dispatch. I got reports from, uh, from a customer who testing Greenplum 5 to do very simple index lookups. So Greenplum's known for analytics and big data, but this customer said, okay, let me take Greenplum, store a bunch of JSON data and do key value store lookups. And they were able to get repeatable 10 millisecond response times from Greenplum. And they said, wow, this is great. You know, I mean, they, they like the fact that it's versatile and that they can do different kinds of workloads. Um, and that helped, part of that comes from the dispatcher we have lazy transaction IDs that helps with concurrency because there's less contention looking for um, in the, in the multi-view concurrency control because when we do queries, we're, we don't care about, we're not increasing the transaction IDs. It's only increasing with updates, inserts, and deletes. And so that makes for lower overhead on concurrency. Um, aggregate queries have a smarter allocation of how they do hash buckets. So it, it, it allocates memory more accurately and, and has less waste there. And we'll talk about correlated subquery performance as well. From the Postgres compatibility, you can see a whole stack of, of new enhancements in Greenplum from the fact that it's gone from one, one version, major version 8.2 to major version 8.3. Uh, we have DBLink to connect to another database cluster. We've got semi-structured data now in Greenplum, so you can store your choice of XML, JSON, JSON or HStore. These are three different semi-structured data formats. So what that means is you've got both your structured data, your semi-structured data that can be a key value with some complex set of, of uh, documents in it. You can also, with, with another feature that comes from Pivotal Greenplum, you can do text analytics. So you can use unstructured data. So you have structured, semi-structured, and unstructured on this big database. Then we've got um, enhancements to geospatial and to the, to the 
functional syntax of Greenplum where, where we introduce improvements to the, to the parameter calling of Greenplum, make it more compatible with the latest version of Postgres. So all of these things are packed into GP5. And now there's a couple of key features that I want to show you. So to show you know, how can Greenplum deliver performance on big data? How, right? So three things I want to talk about are correlated queries, common table expressions, and dynamic partition elimination. These are three things where we can really excel and, and do complex SQL on big data. So when it comes to correlated queries, these are, you can see here there's a subselect. And what we're doing is within the subselect, we're referencing the outer table. And that's a correlated query. And correlated queries are notoriously difficult to implement in a SQL engine. And so the naive, simple way to do that would be a nested loop, where for every outer part of the query, you then repeat the inner query again. And what that means is that as the data grows, you're doing that inner query over and over and over again. That's the simplest way to implement it. But it's also extremely gets slower as your data gets bigger. And many, many, many of the databases out in the world, I don't want to say all, but many have difficulty to look through that and to convert that, decorrelate that query into a, a join. So we say, OK, we know what we're really trying to achieve. So let's do the inner query once, and, and let's get the data we need, and then let's convert that to a join with the outer table and, and not make it repeated for every as the data gets bigger. So this is a, a very key capability that um, stands out from many of the other databases, not all, but many of the other databases in the, in the world. And inside Greenplum, we have as a tester, we have both the original, plan, the original Postgres optimizer and the Greenplum optimizer, so we can benchmark them together. And we can see that when we have these complex correlated queries, that by decorrelating it and converting it to join, we can be up to 100 times faster. And you would ask, OK, so on a typical OLTP database, it's not a big deal because you're not talking about a lot of rows. So if you're running a single node database and you do one of these kind of queries, so, so what? So you got 10,000 rows, you do the nested loop, or, and, and it's not too bad. But if you're talking about billions of rows, it's really bad. Right? So that's why converting these, decorrelating these queries in the optimizer, we get 100x gain, and that's a huge win. Um, common table expression. So a common table expression is the with syntax. So you say with some SQL, and then you go use that like it's a table. And what, uh, what Greenplum does for implementing this is, let me see if I have another slide here, is it creates a common table expression producer and consumers. So it sees, OK, in this query plan, who's going to use the output of this common table expression of this with clause, this temporary table kind of a thing? And then it's going to say, OK, how are they going to use it? And one of the, the really neat things that, that our optimizer, Orca, can do is it can say, OK, there's going to be filters along the way. There's going to be sorting along the way. So let me pre-sort and pre-filter this temporary table that I'm creating that's going to be joined. And that's going to make it faster to join it and to, to use it in, in the rest of the query. So, so that's what we do. And um, you can see here that these, there's these filters here that are going to come into play. And what we do is we include that into the common table expression producer to, to make that temporary table smaller so that when you go and join it, it's faster to join with the other tables. Um, and the results are, again, we can do up to 7x performance gains by in common table expressions on big data. Um, OK, and the third one on the optimizer is partition elimination. So in a, in a large data set, how does the data get so large is people tend to store history. They don't want to just store the current data. They want to say, OK, so I'll, let's say I'm a, a um, cola manufacturer. It's a completely fictitious example. And, and every day I'm making sales, right? I don't want to just store in my database today's sales. I want to store all the sales from today, from yesterday, from the last hundreds of days. So it's that history of data which ends up making the database big. And normally what a user will do is they'll partition that data. 
so that but based on time, it'll make it easier to roll the data off as you want to, to stop storing some old data and start storing new data. And also it makes it easier for the optimizer to say, okay, let me filter out the, the time frames that I'm interested in. So this is called partition elimination. It's filtering out these partitions of the data, these dates or partitions that are not relevant to the query to make the query much faster. So if we had, again, cola production every day for the last 10,000 days, and someone runs a query who wants to sum up the average sale price, but the date filter is only for three days. What that means is that we're gonna only process three days out of these thousands of days of data, and it's gonna be, you know, what is it, three out of a thousand speed, as opposed to processing all the data. If we don't eliminate that data from the processing, it'll take forever. So we got to eliminate these partitions that are not needed, right? So there's two kinds of partition elimination. There's static, which means right in the query, it says date equals blah. And that's the easier one, right? Because the optimizer sees it up front, filters them out, doesn't read that data from disk, doesn't process it. But the second one is dynamic. So as, as part of the query, it generates some information which tells us which dates or which partitions we care about. That's, and then make sure that before you start reading this huge table that you know which partitions you care about and only read those. That's dynamic partition elimination. And you can see in the plan, we've got a dynamic table scan on this partition table. And so that is the key to cutting down the data size that we're going to process and making it go fast. Okay. So that's your optimizer. Your optimizer, that's, that's one of the core points to making the database fast. But the second core point is this is not a single user system. This is a multi-user, highly concurrent analytical system. So we need to segregate and isolate the resources. So this is where Greenplum 5's resource groups come into, come into play. And we're going to break this down into five steps here. Grouping the workloads, creating resource groups, creating rules, monitoring the activity, and then tuning. It's a cycle. So here we've got the categorization of who's using this system. We've got our ETL, which is who's loading in data and processing the original data. We've got our ad hoc users who want to experiment with the data. You've got your, your tactical web queries. So there's a dashboard where people are coming for live interaction. And then you've got your, your recurring reports where it's got to be produced at a certain time to give to the business. So what is the expectation? The expectation is that your tactical queries for the web are going to be responsive, right? And that you want to give way to them to, to give that live feel. But then you want to devote the processing to your reports and your ETLs so that we can meet the SLAs of when the data is supposed to be in and when the reports are supposed to be driven. So after you've categorized your workloads, the next thing is to set up your resource groups to map to the workloads. And the resource groups, you can set factors here. How much concurrency, what's the CPU allocation, what's the memory allocation for that group, which maps back to the workload. Once that's set up, you can then create rules. Now the rules is, is an add-on module to Greenplum. It's called the Pivotal Workload Manager, the Greenplum Workload Manager from Pivotal. That's, that's an add-on module that's not part of the core database, but this other part so far, this is all part of the core database. This is a, an extra feature. And then here we can set additional rules and say, okay, you know, if the query was running for five hours and if the session was five hours running and is idle, let's terminate it. If the query is running for a long time, let's terminate it. We can set these, these um, complex rules to take actions based on what it's, what's going on. And then monitoring what's going on, we've got several views you can use both the open source views and the add-on views. And you can use these to see how many queries are running, how many are queued, do reporting on it, see are people driving the concurrency, and then adjust your, use that to fine tune and adjust your settings over time. So this is what we have in Greenplum 5. This is a, a really big advantage because what we now have is specific CPU targeting in, on, these, on these groups and allowing you to really create that, let's say, that bandwidth for your interactive queries to go, no matter how hard the other people are pushing the system with reporting or, or business intelligence or ETL. Okay, 
So those are some of the bread and butter core features. Now on the advanced analytics side, we've got the machine learning. The key point here is we've got supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning. These can be used to create models in the system. You could do fraud detection, you could do security and analytics, you can do um, demand forecasting based on these models. You can also with the unstructured, I mean the unsupervised, we can do grouping of blog articles or text data into categories that you're not sure what they are, but you want to group them based on the data. The what's new here as of the Green Plum 5 is the graph processing. And so the idea is that with the graph processing that you can store the, the edges and vertex, vertices of a graph that has billions of rows in a table, in tables. And then you can point simplistic functions that are provided by Apache Madlib to these tables and they can provide intelligence and analytics about the graph. So if you want to know, let's say you loaded in a Twitter, let's say you've got Twitter. So how could you do this? You could have a, um, a customer database and you want to map that customer database with the Twitter data and create another set of tables and another schema and combine all that data for analytics. So what does Twitter provide? Twitter can provide structured and semi-structured data. It can have, it comes in a JSON format. It can have a geospatial coordinate. It could have the text of the tweet. It has the location of the tweet. It can have um, metadata about it. And then we can also look at who's following who. We can build a graph out of that and we can start doing analytics on it. And so with the graph processing, you have functions like page rank and graph diameter and closeness centrality. This allows you to understand, okay, who are the influencers in this network? Who's influencing who, right? How is it all working and do reporting based on that? So you can really create this mixed mode database of petabytes of data that you want to analyze with high performance functions. Um, part of it could be text. I'm not going to drill too much into text today, but, be no, but it, it's there. You can do indexing directly into the text that you're searching for. If you want to see, okay, who's tweeting or who's sending messages with topics that match these kind of advanced patterns, or if you want to analyze the natural language processing, the meaning of the text, you can do that. The geospatial analytics in Greenplum 5, we now support images with raster analytics. So you can store not only coordinates, but also images and map them together and, and analyze them as part of your, your data set. And so all of that together, the key point is that you've got the, you've got the engine power you need to do multi-user um, SQL, high performance, advanced SQL on a structured and semi-structured relational database, as well as combining it with your advanced analytics in, a in one database, right? So it's really simple and powerful. The other bit is the, the process and the, the innovation. So there are now, there's a technology called Concourse. Concourse is a, um, a continuous integration pipeline where you can see the source code of our project being compiled. Concourse is not just used by Greenplum, it's used by many people, but you can see a, it creates a pipeline of dependencies. And so as code gets checked in, we compile the code, we run the code, we test the code, and then there's a, ser there's a graph of, of other tests that run. And this is how we can very efficiently test an extremely complex product. And that's all out in the open and open source. So these concourse pipelines are available to anybody you can run these pipelines, you could test Greenplum. It doesn't have to be someone from my company who's testing it. So you could go out on your own and run this and verify that you know, the change I made or you made to Greenplum, it still meets all the functional criteria. That also allows us to be fast. So we're going to continue on our pace. We're doing month, the commitment is to do monthly minor service packs where we're going to be bringing out you know, optimizer enhancements to the tuning we're going to be bringing out small features and then major releases. We're going to an annual cadence. So every year, like a clockwork, there's a next major release. It's going to really turn up the heat here. Um, part of this is of the strategy is the Postgres alignment. So there's no secret inside Greenplum is, is essentially Postgres technology. 
Now there's been a lot of additions and enhancements made to make it operate in an MPP scale out fashion for big data sets and for analytics. And I think from the Greenplum project, how can we win in this market? How can we provide value is to, to align these two things. We need to continue to embrace Postgres as the core engine and then continue to invest heavily our resource from the Greenplum project to make it run at scale for MP, at MPP scale for analytics and for big data. And, and what that does is it relieves the Greenplum project from having to do the thousands of tasks and projects needed to make a core database kernel, right? So if you wanted to start out from scratch and build a database, think of all the components from drivers to parsers to um, user-defined functions to language integrations. It's, it's literally um, tens of thousands of, of people years to build all these parts. Right? And so I always tell this to people looking at other technologies, look at the ecosystem when you're looking at database technology. Do they have the bandwidth? Obviously your, your $100 billion market cap database companies have that bandwidth, but that comes with a price. So either you're gonna pay the price for that, that you know, $100 billion company's product that has thousands of employees building a database, or you wanna go with an ecosystem that's got thousands of contributors going over decades to build this technology. And watch out for the ones who don't, but claim that they can. So with Greenplum and with Postgres, right, we're gonna to continue to bring that Postgres in. And so in the last release, there were 3,300 Postgres commits brought into Greenplum 5, as well as major refactoring to make this process smooth going forward so that we can accelerate this rate. Um, and so our goal is we released Greenplum 5 in September. We want to release Greenplum 6 in September also. Not this one, but the next September. Um, and Greenplum 6, we've already identified some key goals and features around Greenplum 6. So the key goals and features are, okay, let's get more Postgres into Greenplum. So we're looking at the next, we don't know how far we'll get by that time frame. Hopefully it'll be um, a lot farther than we got in the last one because we've got our code refactored and our, and our processes refactored to do this quickly. Um, we're gonna bring write ahead log replication to Greenplum. This is a game changer because this is a solid foundation. Think about what is database logging. Database logging is real-time change tracking of the database, right? So we wanna be able to have the capability to take a snapshot of the system and to then use these database log files to do change capture and be able to apply them, right? We wanna be able to take these log files and apply them to another cluster so that we can have a second cluster running and capture all these changes and being applying them as they come. In addition to that, it's, it's, a, it's a technology that's, that's matured. It has many, it has a number of different capabilities and options we can leverage in terms of the architecture. And as we look to, to being elastic and cloud friendly more and more and more, having the ability to, to push data you know, in different directions and replicate data, this is the flexibility we need. And so right ahead log replication is a foundational infrastructure that's gonna be a cornerstone of Greenplum 6. Um, some other key nice to have features are unlog tables. This is very fast temporary tables so that you can, it's like, think of it like a burner phone, right? You just want to store some data, use it in another calculation and then burn it, right? Foreign data wrappers. Foreign data wrappers are an ecosystem that allow us to query and access remote systems. It could be a, a DB2 database. It could be a MongoDB database. It could be a Dun & Bradstreet um, system that has information. So these foreign data wrappers are out there in a, commu a large community that we can bring these things in and you can use them to tap into other, other systems. Um, now, that's the Greenplum 6 roadmap for the next major, but there's gonna be minors, and I wanna give you some sneak peeks to, to things we're, that the community is working on in the short term. So within this one year time frame and before Greenplum 6 comes out, here's at least six projects, and there's more out there. If you look at everybody doing stuff, there's gotta be at least 10 or 15 cool features and capabilities that are gonna hit before Greenplum 6. But here's six key ones. Number one, continued working on, on GP Orca. So GP Orca, every month you can see something like 20 enhancements. We're look, GP Orca gets 
faster and faster on every minor of these. And it's not just GP Orca for these complex big queries, but as a community, we're seeing the need, like I mentioned, with these short queries. People want to see that the short queries are snappier too. So we're improving both the, the complex queries and the short queries through work in the interconnect and the dispatcher. Number two, a Spark connector. So the idea here is to create a Spark driver so that you can go and, ta and use Greenplum as a data source, bring that data in and do your calculations in Spark. So there are a lot of folks out there doing calculations in Spark and there's a lot of data in Greenplum. So we wanna make a high speed connector for you to bring that data into Greenplum and do whatever you wanna do in Spark for your calculations. PXF, Pivotal Extension Framework, maybe Postgres Extension Framework, I'm not sure, we're gonna maybe rebrand that name, but the key point here with PXF is this is a next-gen Hadoop connector. So this thing can talk to HBase, this can talk to Hive, this can read ORC files, it can do predicate pushdowns. This is a sneak peek. In, in the next month or two, you're gonna see some big announcements around both the Spark and the PXF. PL Container, and we've got one of the PL Container originators here in the audience today. PL Container is a, um, is a, is a way to execute procedural languages within a secure container and outside of the database kernel. So let's say you want to run Python and R, but Python and R, you want to keep them wrapped up. You want to make sure that they're running in a safe space where they can't go and access the local disk. You want to give your data scientists access to go crazy writing Python and R, but you want to make sure that they don't interfere with the DBA's requirements around security and isolation. So PL Container, it uses Docker-like technology to where you create a container, you can push it out there, it has a customized image, and then from there you can run your Python and your R code and it will execute within that secure container to keep it separate and isolated and resource constrained. Um, and that, that enables um, an easier way to deploy and to, to monitor these, these users who want to rapidly innovate with Python and R. GP Backup, GP Backup is the next gen backup and restore for Greenplum. Um, you'll see that coming in this release cycle of 5.x as well before we get to Greenplum 6. And that's going to be a game changer as far as how quickly and easily it is to, to do backup and restore on Greenplum. And then lastly, number six is part of a pivotal add-on for Command Center is workload management and monitoring. So um, what we're talking about here is looking at the, really looking at the um, users of the system and the workloads they want to run. And starting from the workload, categorizing the workloads, and then creating policies and tracking where we can say, okay, this workload is going to come in through these people. It's going to have these kind of characteristics and requirements. Um, these are the policies I want to set on it. These are the alerting I want to set on it. And it's a full life cycle to see those workloads go from the creation of the workload to executing within the resources allocated to monitoring and, and and alerting on that workload, and then keeping it within its boundaries, and then finally being able to save and store these policies and push them out to, to large environments and different clusters and have consistency around, around the system. So these are some sneak peeks. And um, you know, with that, the last thing I want to say is a huge thank you to everybody who's got anything to do with Greenplum. I think if you add up all the folks who are either working on Greenplum in development sense, using Greenplum, um, consulting on Greenplum, working at a, at a customer site where they use Greenplum, there's, there's a worldwide community well into the over 10,000 people. Um, we're in, in over 40 countries in the world. And so a huge thank you to everybody and to, to see, I think the future here is really just getting started because we've, we've built this foundation and you're gonna see a lot of advancements and a lot of excitement. So big thank you to everybody and looking forward to the future.